afternoon, everybody. Um, as you'll see, we've slightly tweaked uh, the title. We've lost a few words, taking note of some of the comments that we heard in yesterday's session on climate change about reducing uh, and simplifying, but not oversimplifying the messages that we're trying to deliver. Um, you're going to get a double act in this session. Myself and Meredith later on will give you a case study of one of the ways that our thinking is developing. Um, but what I'm going to present to you this afternoon is really a snapshot of our research legacy from the last few years, where we are now, and where I think we need to be going over the next uh, five years. And it's also worth me just mentioning briefly that climate change within historic England doesn't reside on the head of any one particular person. It lies in all corners of the organisation, in many, many of the teams, and we knit those various voices of expertise together through a climate change network that I chair, but which speaks to um, all of the facets of historic England. But we also talk very actively with our partners at Historic Scotland, and uh, we have a adaptation group that meets probably a couple of times a year. And um, that group exists really, if you like, as a support network, because we're all challenged with the same kinds of issues. Some of us have more of an emphasis on policy, some more on, uh, on the responses, but all of us really together need to be learning from each other, which is why it's really good to have um, the opportunity to talk to people like Mary and Ewan at Historic Scotland and learn from each other to inform our future research programmes. So what is our baseline evidence? What have we got in the back pocket? In 2011, um, we started a thing in England called the National Heritage Protection Program Plan, which ran for four years. And within that plan, we aligned where we wanted to spend our resources. And one of the outputs of that plan was uh, this series of two reports, which were commissioned from uh, the environmental consultants Atkins and how they compiled those reports was that they did a series of workshops with staff in the organisation and also a number of extended interviews with those staff members really to gather together what people who were working both in the policy, the planning, the management and the research um, avenues really thought were the most key environmental impacts and then building on from that what the climate change impacts might be. And one of the key messages that came out of those reports was that climate change is best considered as a risk multiplier. What that means in practice is that we're seeing environmental change already, and the climate change element just changes the magnitude, the frequency, the geography, and the speed with which those changes take effect. So then last year, no, not last year, in May, we published um, a report that um, sort of took a whole host of drivers of change, environmental only being one of them. We also looked at economics, technology, social change, etc. And we produced this report called Facing the Future. And the test that was applied in that was, yes, we'd identified our shopping list of things that would affect the historic environment. But then we asked, so what? So why do we care about that? What's going to happen? And running through the list of things that are specifically relevant to this conversation that we're having today about climate change, we can pick out the usual suspects, the, the Asians that Marcy um, so eloquently used yesterday, the saturation, the inundation, the erosion, and all of those things, that those agencies that impact through physical, biological, or chemical processes, the fabric of the historic environment. So things like flooding, we've seen many pictures over the last couple of days of flood, flood inundation and saturation, but there are also elements such as the physical impact of those high energy waters themselves and the entrained objects within them, like trees, colliding with historic bridges, causing collapse or irreparable damage that mean that there is an imperative or, a, or rather a call, not an imperative, a call for adaptations to be made to historic structures, which we might, as heritage professionals, find difficult to deal with. We might also argue that they're not necessarily essential. Other changes, I'm not going to dwell on coastal change because, again, we've had a lot of examples of those, many of them many, much more um, uh, eloquent than, than I could give. But what I also wanted to pick up on is that Mary mentioned it does also uh, give us the opportunity to find out new information. If we had not had the scale of soft coast erosion on the East Anglian coastline, we would not have been able to rewrite British prehistory, taking back our understanding of the earliest occupation 
of the UK. Other aspects, temperature change, the swings, the swings to more extremes. So things like hotter, drier conditions that might increase the risk of fire, particularly in our upland landscapes, but also things like freeze-thaw erosion. If we are getting greater intensities of frost action, and I'm not saying that will happen, but if it did, then that would be an additional agency for attritional damage to the fabric of buildings. But as well as these direct impacts, there is also the impact that other actors undertake in the face of mitigating or adapting to climate change. So what the Environment Agency wants to do in terms of its flood defences, does it want to put in flood defences or does it want to do softer options for changing how we manage flood risk in this country? All of these new ways of managing the environment by other sectors will have a consequence for the historic environment. So how do we respond to these? Well, some of the responses are really quite easy. They're quick wins. They might not necessarily be cheap, but they're low impact and they're low risk. And into that bucket, I would put maintenance. Now, we heard that uh, at Historic Scotland, there is a proactive maintenance campaign. But maybe that's something that we can address relatively easily and with little consequent, little negative consequence further down the line. There are other forms of adaptation, the medium to high risk. Those are more challenging because we, A, we don't know precisely what it is we're adapting to. But secondly, particularly for designated sites, it might require us to make fundamental philosophical shifts in what we find acceptable impact on the significance of the site. So, how can, what kind of framework should we be using to really try and work out which approach to take, what kinds of appropriate responses there might be? And I think that that's where risk assessment is really one of the approaches that we really need to be putting a lot of our effort into. <clears throat> I'm going to go on in a moment to give you a couple of examples of risk assessments that we did when we were English Heritage before we became Historic England. But before I do that, I think we, as a sector, we need a sort of two, a twin track approach to this. One research agenda focuses on looking at the material science, what the physical, chemical and biological impacts of environmental change means for fabric, whether that is building fabric, archaeological fabric or collections. There is still a great need for more understanding of those processes of deterioration and what we can do to mitigate or counter them. But there is the second element, which is the place-based based risk assessment. How do those processes affect this place at this time and in the next 5, 10, 20 years? And there are a couple of ways that we can do these risk assessments. One is as happened with the climate change risk assessment for Stonehenge and Avebury World Heritage Site, which was gathering together into it, locking all key stakeholders into a room for a day and brainstorming through different scenarios and working out what those scenarios might mean for the things that were important for that site and its management. And then working out what the responses to those threats might look like. And from that, um, reducing that down into, distilling that down into a table of likelihood of threat, severity of threat, um, and uh, the speed at which we might expect it to be happening. The other way is modelling, or modelling might be too sophisticated and complex a term to apply to this, uh, basically, it's overlay, overlaying the model data from other environmental management um, agencies and overlaying that with the interests <coughs> of your own particular organisation. So when we were English Heritage, we identified two strands that we were particularly keen to uh, get some greater insight into. One was the impact of coastal erosion on the estate and the other was the impact of inland flood risk. So... This report was produced in 2011, and it represents about 11 months' worth of largely desk-based research, followed up by some site-based ground-truthing by one individual. 
So it was a relatively low investment of staff time. But I would argue that the yields that it's brought are significant. So how this study was undertaken was that they took the Environment Agency projections for um, coastal retreat at three time slices. I'm not sure if you can read that, but it's 2025, 2055, and two, uh, 2105. The blue line that you can see is the current mean high water level. And for each one of the properties that were found in a coastal location, and that was, um, I think our sample set was finally 54. So in total, we have over 400 properties, or did have 400 properties in the national collection. Of those, 80 were classified as being in the uh, coastal zone, and of that 80, 54 lay outside of urban areas where we could assume that there would be some mitigation put into place um, to, uh, well, to, to mitigate any coastal change. So of those 54, the analysis demonstrated that two were at high risk of flooding, um, and 48 at some risk of flooding. But out of that, 30, uh, out of that 54, so 70% of the sites, 38 of them were at risk of coastal erosion. And of that, four of them had a very high risk of coastal erosion. And one of the ones that you can see here um, lies on the Isles of Scilly. And one of the things that I think is quite important about this study is that they did not just look at the monuments themselves or the buildings themselves. It looked at the infrastructure surrounding that. So the access points, the car parks, and the associated um, infrastructure that makes the site work. So having done that exercise, we then replicated the methodology, but this time using Environment Agency inland flood risk um, data, the flood risk maps, including the surface water mapping, um, to again look at what was then the estate that we had a duty <coughs> to protect. And as I say, the same, same applied. Use the Environment Agency data to overlay with the estate and identify for each one of those sites not only whether they were at a high, medium or low risk of uh, flooding, but also where within the footprint of that site the flood risk lay and whether it was likely to be from um, surface water runoff or uh, fluvial <coughs> flooding. And for each one, so each one of the sites has a flag that says whether it's at high, medium or low risk. It has a map of the site and it has a list of recommendations that can be used, should the site so wish, to enter into discussions um, with estate managers but also with local authorities and the Environment Agency over flood risk management planning. So where are we now? Well. I'd like to sort of zoom up a level now and think about the headline issues for risk assessment. Because whilst I, I genuinely believe that we need to do a lot more looking at risk assessment in particular places, there is also this issue about trying to risk assess for particular kinds of processes. And one of the hooks that we slightly struggled with for this is, is how do we articulate that at a level where our concerns will be heard not just by our own profession, but by others who, for whom we can either apply to money or political leverage to try and do something about this. So, every five years, the UK government has to carry out an assessment of the current and future risks to the country from climate change. And the next one is due in January 2017, which will be the second one that the UK produced. But we know that the first UK risk assessment, uh, historic environment issues were not given equivalent consideration to the rest of the, uh, to the other sectors. And therefore it became a priority for us to look at how we could articulate some of our concerns within the framework of that risk assessment. So not only did we look at the things that they had identified might be a risk for us, but we also offered up some additional ones that we thought um, were particularly significant for the historic environment. And I'm going to hand over to Meredith now to give you an example of one of the pieces of thinking that we've recently been doing. Okay, I'm absolutely terrified because I've seen we've got less than five minutes and I know this takes six minutes. What am I going to do? Okay, so what I'm going to do is 
still, it might take six minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to uh, take an issue that's highlighted in the CCRA, the Climate Change Risk Assessment, um, namely pests and diseases. I'm going to go through a rough example to show you our thinking, and this is really, really rough. Um, we brought together various existing data sets to allow us to overlay risks and help us identify future pressure points. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel by creating new data sets um, when people have already done all the hard work for us, essentially. So it's important to start out by stressing that this represents uh, more of a thought experiment or work in progress, and it's really only one small facet of what we're trying to do at HE. So I decided to pick something that was fairly topical. It's been in the UK, it's been in the EU, it's been all over the place. It's Ash Dieback. And uh, what does that have to do with heritage and archaeology? Uh, well, Ash represents a key component of some des design landscapes. And more broadly, it's part of historic landscape character. I did a little search on the internet and found out that it was mentioned in Middle March, Jane Eyre, the fireside poem by Celia Congreve. It's, it's everywhere. So there you go. Um, ash dieback, what is it? Uh, it's called cholera. It's caused by a fungus that infects the crown of tree, and it's usually fatal. Um, where is it? On the right, you can see the instance of ash dieback of, uh, as of the 3rd of August of this year. And uh, the darker bits are more infected. On the left, you can see two minutes. Great. Uh, on the left, you can see the woodlands where ash is the dominant species in England and Wales. Um, okay, so we know that ash is important. What else do we know? Uh, we know that younger trees are more susceptible, um, and we know that risk multipliers overlay each other and make things um, worse. So um, a risk multiplier for ash is honey fungus. Honey fungus uh, is pretty prevalent in the UK, as you can see on the right. It's easier to easy to spot the overlaps there from the map that you've already seen and the incidence of honey fungus. Um, now, heightened risk doesn't mean that all the ash trees are going to be infected. It doesn't mean that they're all going to die. It just means that we need to begin to think about the places where change is going to happen the soonest and find out how we can support, support people to make the, the choices for the places that they care about, right? Um, it's important to stress here that change is okay. We like change. Change is not bad. Variety is the spice of life. It's fine. But we have to have the best information so that we can help people make the choices, um, as Mary said. Another risk multiplier for ash is, can you see that? I can't see that. Anyway, before ash is drought, which is likely to become more of an issue moving forward. How much of an issue is debated, and that's why we like our scenario modeling. Um, and I'm most pleased to see other colleagues use scenario modeling as well. Um, here's a map of high, medium, low probability of change in precipitation by the 2020s. This is for a medium uh, emission scenario, and um, usually we'd look at all of the scenarios, high, middling, and low for all the variables, but we don't have time to do that today. We definitely don't have time to do that today. So um, if you look at this slide and the last one together, so you kind of can see where the issues are, um, you can see the east and the southeast show the, the most overlapping risks and increases the danger to the species there. This combined with the Met Office's prediction, and the Met Office is an uh, arm's length body that provides, <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? Um, it provides uh, climate research. Um, more than 75% of ash trees in Kent, which is just there, are going to be um, infected with ash dieback by 2018. So this is kind of serious. Okay, so the last, this is the last slide for me, I promise. Okay, so these are two sites in Kent, Aitham Court and Walmart Castle. They both have ash as uh, part of their planting schemes. And um, we need to think about responses for them. I'm going to go through the responses really quickly, and then I can stop. Um, we can't make the decision for people. That's not our job. Our job is to give everyone the uh, options that they, they can use, and then hopefully they can make the decision that's right for them. That's what we want to try to do. So firstly, what can they do? They can inject trees with pesticides. This is a great thing. This is very, very uh, effective, but it um, is very expensive, and it kills the good bugs as well as the bad bugs. So maybe not the best for everyone, but very good for um, trees of great significance. Okay, uh, We can find replacement species. Um, this sounds fine in principle, but when you, you tell someone that you can think of a replacement species, they get a bit upset because they don't want their beach avenue replaced with something else. That just isn't what they want, so it's hard to do that. Communication is key in that case, and um, lots of people are talking about communication, 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 very important. Had lots more to say about that, I'm not going to say it. Um, we can redesign or re-engineer landscapes, and this is going to be a, a challenge that these guys are going to have to face. And um, the hardest option, we uh, have to talk to people about accepting potential loss. Uh, this is something that everybody's been talking about, and I think we're all uh, feeling really challenged by that. And um, that's the point at which I stop. Are we going to just put up the last slide? Yeah, just, that's it. That, yeah, we're done. We're done. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.